If you're an SEC loyalist, especially one that hasn't been to Atlanta in the last two decades, you probably don't want to see Texas win the conference title in year one. In fact, I would say that's in your top five worst case scenarios for the 2024 season because you've had time to develop a culture, establish dominance in a conference where it just means more. And Texas pulls on up and they pulverize you to pieces. They terrorize teams en route to Atlanta and more than likely to the college football playoff. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Texas is built to win in the SEC. They've been built to win in the SEC since last season, and they've always had the identity to be a competitive roster at a national championship level. But why can Texas win in 2024? You're going to have to go look back at 2020 Alabama for your answer. Let's go ahead and discuss. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? It's Cole Thompson from SEC Unfiltered. Make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. Leave a comment telling us your thoughts on if Texas can hold their own in the SEC next season. Make sure you hit the ring notification. That way you don't miss a single thing going here on this channel. Because we talk college football every single day about the number one conference in the dang sport. Follow me on social media at Mr. Cole Thompson, my own YouTube channel at Mr. Cole Thompson. I talk all things college football over there. Make sure that you follow us on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, at SEC Unfiltered. And for all the number one content surrounding our favorite conference, make sure that you go ahead and visit secunfiltered.com. So can Texas win the SEC in year one? Yes, plain and simple. That could be the end of the video. I really don't have to go much further. but. I will. Here's the reason why I believe in Texas. Number one, it's the guy who is at the helm, Steve Sarkeesian. Not only did he revitalize his career in the SEC, he had pretty damn good results when he was calling plays. Now, don't get me wrong. It's Alabama. You expect great things from Alabama, especially underneath the czar, the villain, the savior, depending on who you are, Nick Saban himself. But it was the way he was able to call plays in the offense, the spread formations, the ability to get three quick passes off in a row, then a quick run that made the defense feel unbalanced, not afraid to sling it deep. Quarterback play was essential for him with Tua Tungavailoa and then Mac Jones. Wide receivers were elite his entire time there. And he also had a very stable defense, not an elite defense, but a stable one that was able to mitigate the waters, force a couple of big time three and outs, get the ball back in the offense's hands to where they could cook. The 2020 season is why Alabama was able to win a national title. Their offense, plain and simple. There's no other way to put it, especially when you have a Heisman Trophy winning wide receiver on your staff. Like Mac Jones came in third because his wide receiver was the reason why we saw no flaws. They had a good rushing attack. Najee Harris, Brian Robinson, good one-two combination. A little bit of physicality, a little bit of versatility, a little bit of elusiveness, a little bit of stockiness. And then you throw in the other receivers alongside it. You had Jalen Waddle for the first half of the season before a torn ACL knocked him out against Tennessee. That allowed you to open up the playbook. John Mechie across the middle of the field. Short, sweet, to the point. Move the sticks. Keep offensive momentum. Everything that you were looking for came in this passing attack. The rushing attack was good inside the red zone, and eventually they were able to put up a lot of points. How many points, you might ask? Well, they finished second in scoring. They finished top 10 in passing. They finished top 10 in total yards, I mean, total offensive yards. They were the number one team on third down conversion. They were a top 10 team of red zone efficiency, and they averaged about 45 points per game. And that was because of speed, plain and simple. Speed won for Alabama in 2020, and eventually won Steve Sarkeesian the keys to the kingdom on the 40 acres. Well, what did he do this offseason? I like what Texas had last year. Texas was a very good team. 12-2, and two, nobody's going to complain. You watch consistent growth, and that's because of Steve Sarkeesian got the baseline of what he learned underneath Nick Saban. But on top of having Steve Sarkeesian, they had good speed. What did they do this offseason? They replaced speed with speed. Plain and simple. There's no other way that you can go ahead and try and phrase this because of that's just it. They replace speed with speed. Silas Bolden is a wide receiver that came from the Pac-12 where he had all conference honors. You probably ask yourself, well, why is that important? Because if he did it in the exact same way Xavier Worthy did. Xavier Worthy was an elite special teamer who also provided value turning short passes into intermediate games and wasn't afraid to be a vertical threat downfield. That's Silas Bolden for you. He was an elite return man in the Pac-12. He was a great play and catch type of ca pass catcher. He was phenomenal in the open space. He made defenders miss. And the biggest thing of all about him is that he found his way into the end zone more often than not. 
He could turn a five-yard hitch pattern into a 25-yard gain. He wasn't afraid to go ahead and open up the passing attack down deep. 25 yards later, he's in the end zone. That's your Xavier Worthy replacement. What about Adonai Mitchell? He's now gone. How do we go ahead and replace him? Uh, you bring in Matthew Golden from Houston, another all Big 12 conference member, another all Big 12 conference player on special teams that also can play on the outside, can play in the slot, can be a flanker, can be an X receiver, can be a Z receiver, interchangeability. That's exactly what happened at Alabama. You also have Jonte Cook. Anybody remember that name? Well, he was one of the premier wide receivers coming out in 2022. Uh, he sat the last year behind good old Xavier Worthy. And he's got track speed. He has track speed to where we don't even know how fast he is. You know how fast Silas Bolden is. Jonte Cook could be faster. He could be a second behind him. But still, that's a one-two combination that's lethal that most defensive backs are going to have struggles with. On top of that, you also bring in Isaiah Bond from Alabama. Alabama, last season, Isaiah Bond's going to be remembered for one thing. Fourth and 31. You probably need to go back and watch the game in Atlanta when Alabama took on Georgia. There were a couple of big third down grabs from number 17, who's switching his number, I think, to number seven now. But that was a guy who, without him and Jalen Milrow working cohesively, Georgia is undefeated. The number one seed and potentially a three-peat champion. Isaiah Bond did that. And now that's working with a veteran quarterback in Quinn Ewers. That veteranship, another year to learn the offense, another year to build, grow, and adapt, is going to do wonders as well. Because of now, any little tidbit about the playbook, you feel like Ewers knows. There are some things that I do worry about with Ewers. Number one is footwork. I think I need to see a little bit more balance, consistency when it comes to it. His trajectory of the arm ball, you know, when he releases it, sometimes he can go a little bit array, which led to a couple of errant passes that were over the head of Xavier Worthy, slightly behind Adonai Mitchell, slightly behind Jordan Whittington, but still, for the most part, there's a reason why we are talking about Quinn Ewers as one of the most polished passers, not just in the SEC, but in college football in general. And he can be, absolutely. On top of that, you have a defense that added in plug-and-play starters at vital positions you lost, including Andrew Makuba from Clemson and Trey Moore from UTSA. Here's the thing about Sark. He brings in that Alabama culture. We know that we are one of the premier schools in college football. We know that our burnt orange Longhorn logo carries a little bit of weight. And so if you want to be a part of the Longhorns, you got to be a special player. That's what we're trying to emulate here. Because you got to be special to play at Alabama. You got to be special to go play at Georgia. And even if so, you have to prove your worth to get on. Stetson Bennett was not just a, oh, look at me, five-star talent. No, he was a walk-on that eventually earned his right to become the starter. That's the same vision in Texas. So, Angie Makuba was a number one defensive back in the ACC as a freshman. He won defensive freshman of the year. And Trey Moore is coming off of a dominant season at UTSA where he just won AAC defensive player of the year. And those are the guys that you're adding in to be plug-and-play starters, not to mention a bunch of other names that were brought in just as versatility purposes. So, Texas already has an offense that emulates very much what you had in 2020 with Devonta Smith, John Mechie, Jalen Waddell, Najee Harris, Brian Robinson, Mac Jones, with guys like Quinn Ewers, Silas Bolden, Isaiah Bond, Matthew Golden, Jaden Blue, CJ Baxter, a stable, sturdy offensive line headlined by All-American Kelvin Banks, and a defense that can get the job done. If you're not seeing eye to eye here, ladies and gentlemen, this is Alabama just a few years ago when they beat up on everybody en route to beating Ohio State in the national championship. And that was a COVID year where they only played SEC competition. They torched Texas A&M. In fact, the main reason why Texas A&M didn't get into the college football playoff was the voters, the committee, was probably looking at Notre Dame's resume. And they were looking at Texas A&M's resume. And they see Notre Dame, what they were able to do. They see what Alabama was able to do. They see what, what Ohio State was able to do. They see what Clemson did. And they go, well, A&M lost by 20 to this Alabama team. That could be the case for a multitude of teams that are trying to make it to the CFP next year. 5-7 format. So what does that mean? The college football playoff committee is probably going to give a little bit of weight to the SEC, but one bad performance against Texas, that might be the difference of Tennessee getting in over an LSU. That might be the difference of a team, I don't know, like Oklahoma. Surprise, surprise. Getting in over a Texas A&M or a Kentucky being that surprise roster. 
I also look at Texas' schedule. If they win and they do everything right, how can you say that they don't belong in the CFP? And more importantly, that they aren't making it to the to the conference championship. They got games to start the year off against Colorado State. Then they travel to Ann Arbor in week two. Go ahead and preach yourself this for a second. Hey, uh, Texas is going to the SEC. Uh, Jim Harbaugh is no longer going to be running the show as the national championship winning roster. Oh, and this game is going to be playing in Ann Arbor, which is going to have major playoff implications. It almost happened in the national championship. Like imagine telling yourself that five years ago, Texas, SEC, uh, national champion, big, T- big 10. Like, yeah, imagine just having that thought process Well, it's happening. And it could end up being a really massive game. After that games against UTSA, Louisiana, Monroe, Mississippi state. And then of course you get the granddaddy of them all. Cotton Bowl matchup, Red River Showdown, and of course Dallas. You win that game, you close out the year with six matchups against Georgia, Vanderbilt, Florida, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Texas A&M. You can win all those games. You can beat Georgia, you can easily beat Florida, you can beat Texas A&M, even though the game is at Kyle Field, if this offense is anything predicated to what was run in 2020. If you get an offense that's averaging 45 points per game, who gives a rat's fadoodle how many points you're allowing? As long as it's under 45, you're in a good spot. And that allows you to coach, allows you to stay undefeated. Even if Texas were to go 11-1, and let's just say their one loss came, I don't know, randomly to Oklahoma. They're still in the hunt. And let's just say they went 10-2. and Let's just say they went 10-2 and because they lose to Michigan in Week 2 and they lose to Georgia. They're still in the hunt. Because it would only be one loss in conference play. And that one loss in conference play may not end up being the reason they go to Atlanta, but other teams falling apart in the process could open up another avenue. I just look at Texas. I look at what they brought in. Speed, speed, speed. They basically took a page out of the great movie of Top Gun and said they had the need, the need for speed. And they brought in now the Fast and Furious family. Maybe it ends up working out. Who the hell knows? What I do know for a fact is, is that if this offense is anywhere near what it was underneath Steve Sarkeesian, the same guy who created one of the most dynamic passing attacks in all of college football. In fact, Joe Burrow decided to have a record and Steve Sarkeesian said, nope, I would like that record. Please give it over here. Thank you very much. You just go have fun in the NFL. If he's able to do that in Austin with the players that he added in, Texas is going to win the SEC in year one. I'm very sorry to all the fans out there. Uh, you know, the South Carolinas, the Vanderbilts, the Kentuckys, the Texas A&Ms, the uh, Mississippi States of the world. You had a good run. You had a good run as being a team in the SEC that was going to be talked about. Texas is about ready to move any one of you to the kids' table if you're not already there, and uh, they're going to win a, probably a conference title game before you do. Make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. Leave a comment telling me your thoughts. Can Texas win the SEC in year one? Tell everybody about this channel, your friends, your enemies, your best of bros, college football fanatics everywhere. Follow me on my own social media page, at Mr. Cole Thompson. Follow us on social media wherever you get it. TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, You call it X, I call it Twitter, whatever. SEC Unfiltered. Download the podcast. Go ahead, people. Make sure that you listen to the podcast daily. At SEC Unfiltered on Google Play, on iTunes, on Spotify, wherever you get your podcast listening systems. Make sure that you also follow me on my own YouTube channel, at Mr. Cole Thompson. And to keep up with everything going on in the number one conference in college sports, make sure that you visit SECUnfiltered.com. I'm Cole Thompson. Until next time, folks. Later.